Welcome class, Dr. Trentini here, and today we'll be going through a leadership lecture. Now, leadership is something that is important to everyone, so today I'm going to be taking the time to review a few key concepts. These concepts are probably different than a book that you may uh, see within our college. My last degree was in interdisciplinary leadership, so I've had the opportunity to not, to not only read countless books, but many studies, case studies, journal articles in order to understand this concept in a way that may be different than what a lot of people are used to. I will be going over some of the models of leadership that are familiar to you already later on in this lecture. But to begin, I'm going to be adding in some different perspectives for you with the historical context of leadership and some different ways to see this in your lives. So let's begin. So to begin, um, we need to just get some definitions out there as far as what leadership and a leader may be. So on the screen, I have two different words. I have leader and leadership. So what are those? Are they one and the same or are they different? When you think about it, what are you thinking of? Think about the people in your lives. Maybe a job or maybe there was some organization that you were a part of. So is the person who's named, quote unquote, the leader, always have that leadership? So when you start to add the word leadership into this, things change a little bit. A leader is a person that is either appointed or emerges from a group. Now a leader and followers are actually a type of agreement that we have with each other. You can't have a leader without followership. And followership is an agreement that we make that says we've decided we somehow respect that you're the leader. Now, it does not mean that you like the person. So you may be hired in a job and you have a boss or a manager that you don't like and you don't have much of a choice unless you will, you, your choice is if you want a job, this person is your leader, is some type of a boss or a manager to you. So we have to make certain agreements that leaders and uh, leaders within groups, that they are leaders, at least by name. Now that I've described what a leader is, we know that we can have leaders that don't necessarily lead. And that's what the word leadership means. Leadership is the ability for someone to move a group towards a goal. And that is a skill set. Is it easy? No. Is it, is it easier for some people? Maybe. So let's take a look at a couple of other things when we're looking at leaders and leadership. So going into a historical context, were leaders born? That's what they used to think before the industrial age. So uh, Burns, he was a scholar, one of the first scholars in, le in leadership, and in 1948 he wrote the first textbook on leadership. And one of the things noted is the historical context is for a long time people thought that either you were born a leader or a follower. And their evidence uh, were in you know, maybe military leaders, royalty, people that were born into these positions. So there was a specialness factor to being a leader. But that's not what they learned later when the industrial age came about. What they found is people were put in leader positions and at first they weren't all that good at it. They weren't good at guiding groups towards goals, but they learned the skills to do it. And there were, of course, some people that were better than others, but they learned how to move groups towards a skill. So after the industrial age or during the industrial age, this is where this concept was that it, it isn't necessarily that you're born with leadership skills, that anybody can learn these skills. 
So that's out the window. You can be a leader even if you don't have the skill set. So now that we know that anybody can be a leader, um, and there's also another concept called the contingency theory, which means that having those skills are important for everyone because the opportunity will arise for you to step into leadership positions. So will you have the skill set to lead a group to reach goals? Now, now that we have looked at some different concepts of leader or leadership, I want you to note that I haven't been talking about the ethics of leadership, and we'll talk about that later. Now that we have moved past this first stage, let's talk about how leaders can move people towards goals. Now on this slide, you see the word power, and power is the only way that we, as leaders, are able to move groups towards goals. Now, followers know this, so we as followers know that we're probably not going to do a whole lot for a group goal unless there's something in it for us. So there are different types of power that we can have access to, and maybe some of those other types of power we actually have to be given in some way. And so let's take a look at those or earn them. Okay, let's take a look at power. French and Rabin in 1948 conducted a modest study at a, an organization where workers were pressing or ironing pajamas. This study actually was important because French and Rabin came up with five different types of power that influence groups. Now, the interesting thing was, is they were looking at how groups that within the workers were influencing others. So they were looking at some issues and some problems with um, your modern day bullying, which, which was actually within this organization. They called it a different word. They called it scapegoating. But in today's modern times, we call it bullying. So they were focused on some of the internal issues that were happening with workers that were not doing very well, that, that were once high performers and then not high performers, and what was going on with that. They identified five sources of power that influence people to do different things. The first one is positional power. And that power means that a person has that position that they've either been, they've emerged, and that's the word leader, they've emerged into this position of a leader, or they've been chosen or selected somehow. So for example, in a job, you may have minimal requirements in order to apply for it in order to get this job. So if it's a supervisory position, some of those things could be already have supervisory experience or have a certain degree. So that's one way of actually being put into a position of power. You may apply for it, you may be voted in for it, for example, in local governments or, uh, well, big governments. Um, so we, we're looking at you have somehow stepped into this position, and a lot of times there are other things that are involved. Now, of course, with positional power in a group, it doesn't have to be as formal. So somebody can say, you know, I just think you'd be a good leader. Why don't you, why don't you do this? Why don't you coordinate this? And you may accept it. So positional power um, is, is a relationship, is an acceptance of groups that you know, we will follow and you're the, you are the leader. Um, now, there's toxicity in groups, so it doesn't necessarily mean that that will happen, but somewhere along the lines, there's been an agreement that there's a positional leader. Now, the next one is coercive power. Now, coercive power, as I mentioned before, is um, the, the more unethical ways of leadership. So coercive power can be bullying, for example. Now, coercive power is um, sometimes needed. So in a life or death situation, 
I can imagine sometimes when people are working in an ER or maybe a combat zone in the military, this is important to have sometimes. But when leaders are using coercive power just for kicks because they want to be mean, then that's a problem. So that's the manipulating type of power that threatens others. If you don't do this, then you know whatever it is, whatever threat that means something to us will be withheld. So it could be if you don't work every weekend, you won't get that extra day off in the summer that you want so bad. And that is a type of coercive power. It's not nice, of course, overall. Sometimes it's necessary, but it does run into a lot of issues. A lot of issues that are coming from leadership with coercive power creates a toxic, untrusting work environment. If this course of power is happening within groups, as what French and Robin were talking about, it is detrimental to the well-being of the person that's going through this kind of stress. So within followers, you can be using power in a way that can be beneficial or hurtful to the group and the group's goals. So in this particular example with this study, there was a woman who was a particularly fast presser or ironing. Uh, she would iron the pajamas very quickly. But because she was doing so well, she was actually having some um, individuals within her organization bully her. And so she stopped working so hard. She stopped doing these things so that they would lay off and they wouldn't be bothering her. With some changes in their department, those people were removed from that situation, and she ended up doing far better after that situation changed. A chorus of power, or that manipulation, that meanness that can happen, um, it works, and that's that's the bigger problem with bullying, as you know, as you know, popular campaigns are out, the zero tolerance bullying. And um, the way that to help bullying is to have administrators and people in leadership positions that don't allow it and that stop it very quickly with strict rules. Without that, um, your followers are left to their own devices, which is very difficult to combat. Um, so when we're looking at coercive power, it's one of the most frustrating things for me as an instructor, a leader in my own classrooms, because I don't have a lot of solutions except what I've read in the research. So I kind of count on you, my students, to resolve this. Now that we've talked about power as far as positional and coercive power, let's move to reward power. Reward power. Why do we do things that we would otherwise not do? So this is where there's something in it for us, like going to a job. When you go to a job, you're likely paid for it. So that monetary incentive is a type of power. The other things you can look at, so those things that are tangible like money, rewards in some way, but there's other types of power that work for us. So um, that recognition can be a type of reward power that we have. You know, you get the, let's say, parking lot spot of the month. You don't have to walk from the far ends of the parking lot. You can park right up in front because you made quota. And that quota is that incentive, that reward power to get you to work really hard. Um, and that works very well. Um, now, there are some catches to reward power. Reward power works best if leaders, first of all, have the legitimate authority to reward people. So you can't just say, I'm going to do this for you, and it never happens. Then you lose your ability to influence others. And it also works better if you are able to reward the person more immediately than farther in the future. So if the reward power is, um, you know, let's say that it's a bonus check, but the bonus check doesn't come for six months later, that loses its reward power. It loses its power 
to influence people to do things. Now that we have talked about reward power, um, let's take a look at expert power. Expert power, what you know. So individuals that have expert power, or if they present themselves in a way that makes it look like they know what they're doing, then they have a certain power within a group, they have a certain influence within a group. So you can have expert power, of course, by learning things and by having experience in something. So a lot of the times expert power can be coupled with positional power, which means that, let's say, minimum requirements for a job, you have to have a certain degree, a bachelor's degree in this thing in order to um, even be considered for this job. So if you're in that, that job, then individuals know that you have at least that minimal expert power, and then you're a great resource to be making decisions for groups. Expert power can come from those formal routes of education, but they don't necessarily have to. So if somebody is just really good and really smart at something, you may lean to them and, and ask them, well, what do you think of this as a group before you make decisions? So that person has that influence. So expert power is very good, especially if a group values that kind of expertise. Next, reverent power. Reverent power is the power that people have because they are nice and you like them. So if you think in your world of people that you did things for or you did things because they were nice, they have reverent power. You like them, you respect them, and that is a type of power that's very useful and everybody can do it. So reverend power is that niceness and, and I, I can't stress enough that this is a very valuable type of power that we have to influence people. Now as French and Rabin continued their studies and other scholars started studying these five sources of power, other sources of power were emerging from this. So another one that came out from this, and this is something you probably hear a lot about, is networking is a type of power. So people that know people in all different areas and they have relationships are a source of power. And you can think of maybe yourself or other people in your life that have a lot of connections. If you put that with reverent power, that is a really great source of power. So if somebody's gonna recommend you for a job and they have network power so they know someone that can get you into the interview, you better hope that they have that reverent power as well. It's a great tool if you are working with someone that has that network and reverent power. Now, um, when you start combining other types of power together, I mean, the more you have, the better, um, expert and reverent power, so knowing things and being liked is actually called charisma. So some people may not realize that's what charisma is, but that's what charisma is. Combining those sources of power together is something that we are just drawn to. So leaders that have charisma, we really like. Hey class, we're reaching almost 20 minutes on this particular lecture. So we had an opportunity to define leader and leadership as well as look at a few things in the historical context of how leadership was viewed. We talked about sources of power and we still have a few more things to go through, but let's take a break right now. And when you come back, you'll be looking not only in the textbook, but at the different models of leadership. And we'll take a look at how ethics influence leadership. How you spend your breaks. For example, I would spend my break playing with my dad, Smokey, over here, who is not very cam... Oh, hi there. <laughs> I was going to say she's not very good with cameras, but she sure is entertaining.